Hi everyone, and welcome back to our reading of Five Children and It by E. Nesbitt. We left off last time just after the children wished for wings. So, let's continue and find out what happens next. All the words in the English dictionary, and in the Greek lexicon as well, are, I find, of no use at all to tell you exactly what it feels like to be flying. So I will not try. But I will say that to look down on the fields and woods, instead of along at them, is something like looking at a beautiful live map, where, instead of silly colours on paper, you have real moving sunny woods and green fields laid out one after the other. As Cyril said, and I can't think where he got hold of such a strange expression, it does you a fair treat. It was most wonderful, and more like real magic than any wish the children had had yet. They flapped and flew and sailed on their great rainbow wings, between green earth and blue sky, and they flew over Rochester, and then swerved round towards Maidstone, and presently they all began to feel extremely hungry. Curiously enough, this happened when they were flying rather low, and just as they were crossing an orchard, where some early plums shone red and ripe, they paused on their wings. I cannot explain to you how this is done, but it is something like treading water when you are swimming, and hawks do it extremely well. Yes, I dare say, said Cyril, though no one had spoken. But stealing is stealing, even if you've got wings. Do you really think so? said Jane briskly. If you've got wings, you're a bird, and no one minds birds breaking the commandments. At least, they may mind, but the birds always do it, and no one scolds them or sends them to prison. It was not so easy to perch on a plum tree as you might think, because the rainbow wings were so very large. But somehow they all managed to do it, and the plums were certainly very sweet and juicy. Fortunately, it was not till they had all had quite as many plums as were good for them that they saw a stout man, who looked exactly as though he owned the plum trees, come hurrying through the orchard gate with a thick stick, and with one accord they disentangled their wings from the plum-laden branches and began to fly. The man stopped short, with his mouth open, for he had seen the boughs of his trees moving and twitching, and he had said to himself, Them young varmint, at it again, and he had come out at once, for the lads of the village had taught him in past seasons that plums want looking after. But when he saw the rainbow wings flutter up out of the plum tree, he felt that he must have gone quite mad, and he did not like the feeling at all. And when Anthea looked down and saw his mouth go slowly open, and stay so, and his face become green and mauve in patches, she called out, Don't be frightened, and felt hastily in her pocket for a three-penny bit with a hole in it, which she had meant to hang on a ribbon round her neck for luck. She hovered round the unfortunate plum owner, and said, We have had some of your plums. We thought it wasn't stealing, but now I'm not so sure. So here's some money to pay for them. She swooped down towards the terror-stricken grower of plums, and slipped the coin into the pocket of his jacket, and in a few flaps she had rejoined the others. The farmer sat down on the grass, suddenly and heavily. Well, I'm blessed, he said. This here is what they call delusions, I suppose. But this here threepenny, he had pulled it out and bitten it. That's real enough. Well, from this day forth I'll be a better man. It's the kind of thing to sober a chap for life, this is. I'm glad it was only wings, though. I'd rather see the birds as aren't there, and couldn't be, even if they pretend to talk, than some things as I could name. He got up slowly and heavily, and went indoors, and he was so nice to his wife that day that she felt quite happy, and said to herself, Law, whatever have I come to the men? And smartened herself up and put a blue ribbon bow at the place where her collar fastened on, and looked so pretty that he was kinder than ever. So perhaps the winged children really did do one good thing that day. If so, it was the only one, for really there is nothing like wings for getting you into trouble. But, on the other hand, if you are in trouble, there is nothing like wings for getting you out of it. This was the case in the matter of the fierce dog who sprang out at them when they had folded up their wings as small as possible, and were going up to a farm door to ask for a crust of bread and cheese, for in spite of the plums they were soon just as hungry as ever again. Now, there is no doubt whatever that, if the four had been ordinary wingless children, that black and fierce dog would have had a good bite out of the brown stocking leg of Robert, who was the nearest. But at its first growl there was a flutter of wings, and the dog was left to strain at his chain, and stand on his hind legs, as if he were trying to fly too. 
They tried several other farms, but at those where there were no dogs, the people were far too frightened to do anything but scream. And at last, when it was nearly four o'clock, and their wings were getting miserably stiff and tired, they alighted on a church tower and held a council of war. We can't possibly fly all the way home without dinner or tea, said Robert, with desperate decision. And nobody will give us any dinner, or even lunch, let alone tea, said Cyril. Perhaps the clergyman here might, suggested Anthea. He must know all about angels. Anybody could see we're not that, said Jane. Look at Robert's boots and Squirrel's plaid necktie. Well, said Cyril firmly, if the country you're in won't sell provisions, you take them. In wars, I mean. I'm quite certain you do. And even in other stories, no good brother would allow his little sisters to starve in the midst of plenty. Plenty, repeated Robert hungrily, and the others looked vaguely round the burr leads of the church tower and murmured, In the midst of? Yes, said Cyril impressively. There is a larder window at the side of the clergyman's house, and I saw things to eat inside. Custard pudding and cold chicken and tongue and pies and jam. It's rather a high window, but with wings. How clever of you, said Jane. Not at all, said Cyril modestly. Any born general, Napoleon or the Duke of Marlborough, would have seen it just the same as I did. It seems very wrong, said Anthea. Nonsense, said Cyril. What was it Sir Philip Sidney said when the soldier wouldn't give him a drink? My necessity is greater than his. We'll club together our money, though, and leave it to pay for the things, won't we? Anthea was persuasive, and very nearly in tears, because it is most trying to feel enormously hungry and unspeakably sinful at one and the same time. Some of it was the cautious reply. Everyone now turned out its pockets on the lead roof of the tower, where visitors for the last hundred and fifty years had cut their own and their sweethearts' initials with penknives in the soft lead. There was five and seven pence halfpenny altogether, and even the upright Anthea admitted that that was too much to pay for four people's dinners. Robert said he thought eighteen pence, and half a crown was finally agreed to be handsome. So Anthea wrote on the back of her last term's report, which happened to be in her pocket, and from which she first tore her own name and that of the school, the following letter. Dear Reverend Clergyman, We are very hungry indeed because of having to fly all day, and we think it is not stealing when you are starving to death. We are afraid to ask you for fear you should say no, because of course you know about angels, but you would not think we were angels. We will only take the necessities of life, and no pudding or pie, to show you it is not greediness, but true starvation that makes us make your larder stand and deliver. But we are not highwaymen by trade. Cut it short, said the others with one accord, and Anthea hastily added, Our intentions are quite honourable, if you only knew. And here is half a crown to show we are sincere and grateful. Thank you for your kind hospitality. From us four. The half crown was wrapped in this letter, and all the children felt that when the clergyman had read it, he would understand everything, as well as anyone could who had not even seen the wings. Now, said Cyril, of course there's some risk. We'd better fly straight down the other side of the tower, and then flutter low across the churchyard and in through the shrubbery. There doesn't seem to be anyone about, but you never know. The window looks out into the shrubbery. It is embowered in foliage, like a window in a story. I'll go in and get the things. Robert and Anthea can take them as I hand them out through the window. And Jane can keep watch. Her eyes are sharp. And whistle if she sees anyone about. Shut up, Robert. She can whistle quite well enough for that, anyway. It ought not to be a very good whistle. It'll sound more natural and bird-like. Now then, off we go. I cannot pretend that stealing is right. I can only say that on this occasion it did not look like stealing to the hungry four, but appeared in the light of a fair and reasonable business transaction. They had never happened to learn that a tongue, hardly cut into, a chicken and a half, a loaf of bread and a siphon of soda water cannot be bought in the stores for half a crown. These were the necessities of life which Cyril handed out of the larder window when... Quite unobserved and without hindrance or adventure, he had led the others to that happy spot. He felt that to refrain from jam, apple pie, cake and mixed candied peel was a really heroic act, and I agree with him. He was also proud of not taking the custard pudding, and there I think he was wrong, because if he had taken it there would have been a difficulty about returning the dish, 
No one, however starving, has a right to steal china pie dishes with little pink flowers on them. The soda water siphon was different. They could not do without something to drink, and as the maker's name was on it, they felt sure it would be returned to him wherever they might leave it. If they had time, they would take it back themselves. The man appeared to live in Rochester, which would not be much out of their way home. Everything was carried up to the top of the tower and laid down on a sheet of kitchen paper which Cyril had found on the top shelf of the larder. As he unfolded it, Anthea said, I don't think that's a necessity of life. Yes, it is, said he. We must put the things down somewhere to cut them up. And I heard father say the other day people got diseases from Germans in rainwater. Now there must be lots of rainwater up here. And when it drives up, the Germans are left, and they'd get into the things, and we should all die of scarlet fever. What are Germans? Little waggly things you see with microscopes, said Cyril, with a scientific air. They give you every illness you can think of. I'm sure the paper was necessary, just as much as the bread and the meat and water. Now then, oh my eyes, I am hungry. I do not wish to describe the picnic party on the top of the tower. You can imagine well enough what it is like to carve a chicken and a tongue with a knife that has only one blade, and that snapped off short about halfway down. But it was done. Eating with your fingers is greasy and difficult, and paper dishes soon get to look very spotty and horrid. But one thing you can't imagine, and that is how soda water behaves when you try to drink it straight out of a siphon, especially a quite full one. But if imagination will not help you, experience will, and you can easily try it for yourself if you can get a grown-up to give you the siphon. If you want to have a really thorough experience, put the tube in your mouth and press the handle very suddenly and very hard. You had better do it when you are alone, and out of doors is best for this experiment. However you eat them, tongue and chicken and new bread are very good things, and no one minds being sprinkled a little with soda water on a really fine hot day. So that everyone enjoyed the dinner very much indeed, and everyone ate as much as it possibly could. First, because it was extremely hungry, and secondly, because, as I said, tongue and chicken and new bread are very nice. Now, I dare say you will have noticed that if you have to wait for your dinner till long after the proper time, and then eat a great deal more dinner than usual, and sit in the hot sun on the top of a church tower, or even anywhere else, you become soon and strangely sleepy. Now Anthea and Jane and Cyril and Robert were very like you in many ways, and when they had eaten all they could, and drunk all there was, they became sleepy, strangely and soon, especially Anthea, because she had got up so early. One by one they left off talking and leaned back, and before it was a quarter of an hour after dinner, they had all curled round and tucked themselves up under their large, soft, warm wings and were fast asleep. And the sun was sinking slowly in the west. I must say it was in the west, because it is usual in books to say so, for fear careless people should think it was setting in the east. In point of fact, it was not exactly in the west either, but that's near enough. The sun, I repeat, was sinking slowly in the west, and the children slept warmly and happily on, for wings are cosier than eider-down quilts to sleep under. The shadow of the church tower fell across the churchyard, and across the vicarage, and across the field beyond, and presently there were no more shadows, and the sun had set, and the wings were gone, and still the children slept, but not for long. Twilight is very beautiful, but it is chilly, and you know, however sleepy you are, you wake up soon enough, if your brother or sister happens to be up first and pulls your blankets off you. The four wingless children shivered and woke, and there they were, on the top of a church tower in the dusky twilight, with blue stars coming out by ones and twos and tens and twenties over their heads, miles away from home, with three shillings and three halfpence in their pockets, and a doubtful act about the necessities of life to be accounted for, if anyone found them with the soda water siphon. They looked at each other. Cyril spoke first, picking up the siphon. We'd better get along down and get rid of this beastly thing. It's dark enough to leave it on the clergyman's doorstep, I should think. Come on. There was a little turret at the corner of the tower, and the little turret had a door in it. They had noticed this when they were eating, but had not explored it, as you would have done in their place. Because, of course, when you have wings and can explore the whole sky, doors seem hardly worth exploring. Now they turned towards it. 
Of course, said Cyril, this is the way down. It was, but the door was locked on the inside, and the world was growing darker and darker, and they were miles from home, and there was the soda water siphon. I shall not tell you whether anyone cried, nor, if so, how many cried, nor who cried. You will be better employed in making up your minds what you would have done if you had been in their place. And that's where we leave off for today. Join us next time to find out what happens next when we read Chapter 5, No Wings. Thanks for listening.